Welcome to the Biggs Museum of American Arts virtual tour on this March 2nd. Today we will be exploring the Contemporary Art Gallery up on the third floor. So hi everybody, my name is Ryan Grover. I'm the museum's curator. Um, I'm the Soul C. Biggs Curator of American Art here at the Biggs Museum. Um, and um, you'll have to let us know at some point, um, whether through uh, sort of raising your hand or through asking questions, um, but you'll have to let us know if um, anybody is new to this new, this line of uh, programming that Kristen and I have been doing here at the museum for about a year, this sort of digital platform that we've created. Um, so just to let you know, we're going to be looking at a number of works here that have literally just installed this afternoon. Um, you are sort of in the middle of a war zone. That's a sort of a sneak peek. We don't even have labels or signs up yet. Um, not everything is in place yet. Lots of our sculptures and things like that haven't been placed yet, but we're going to be able to see a sneak peek into um, the contemporary side of um, from our From the Vaults exhibition. Um, and this is a way for us to do a deep dive into some of the fastest growing sections of our collection, of our permanent collection here at the museum. Um, and that is 20th and especially 21st century artworks. Uh, we have a lot of them now. Like we didn't, <laughs> uh, everything, almost everything that you see, that you will see today, as well as the stuff in the background that we won't even necessarily be hitting on, have been collected within the last like 15 years or so. And we literally don't really have exhibition space for it. Like we don't have galleries to be able to accommodate it. So there are things that I have put out. I've been having a lot of fun the last couple of weeks. Um, there are things that I have um, only had on exhibit once in the last like 18 years that I've been working here. There are a couple of things, or actually I should say, there are a number of things out in the museum that I've never had on display. Uh, so we really did kind of rake the vaults, trying to pull out interesting, fun things that we can share with you. And um, and it's wild. It's uh, you know we've always been this institution that sort of has this great kind of balance point between fine arts, meaning like painting, photography, sculpture, and then decorative arts, like the household arts, the tangible arts, the furniture, the silver, the ceramics. And we've always been sort of like a one for one kind of balance point between those two poles. And it was, you know, that was something that was defined by our museum's founder. But interestingly, because of the sort of uh, the way that we have um, coordinated these couple of exhibitions um, between the Impressionism and plein air um, period exhibition on the first floor, as well as the modern contemporary artworks here on the third floor, we have definitely gone way over on the fine art side. So the museum feels very differently right now. And, um, and it's, it's exciting. I think that you'll have a lot of fun when you're able to come and visit. Um, so once again, we are open. We are open. I think it's like five days a week and we are four days a week from 10 to four. Check the website, um, check those dates, get a, um, a reservation and definitely sort of get in here to take a look around. Um, the only person that you will see without a mask is me right now so that I can talk to you. But otherwise, everybody's wearing masks and, um, and we've been having a good time with it. So um, the other side of uh, what I wanted to talk to you about tonight, um, well, I'll get to that in a little bit. But so I'm going to just jump into some of these artworks. Some things probably be familiar. I mean, I've grabbed some things that have been great favorites for mine, but some things, like I said, are like brand new debuts. Like we've never really sort of exhibited them in any sort of great capacity. And, um, and I'm really, really thrilled to be able to do that. So, um, so bear with me. And um, if I stumble over some of these things, because I'm not used to talking about them, um, you'll have to forgive me, but I'll get better at it. But come and see because the show's great. So that said, oh, this is what I remember what I wanted to talk to you about. If you have questions during this talk, we're just going to be sort of roaming through the galleries a little bit. So if you have questions, um, 
depending upon whether or not we like how our timing is going, we might sort of grab some questions in the middle of the talk, but maybe we'll just answer questions as they pop up. And if you haven't really used Zoom before, sort of cover your cursor above the, my, my face, cover it, or hover it above the image that you see in front of you, and a menu bar should pop up from the top or the bottom of your screen, um, one or the other. And there should be a space where you can click on and then type in questions to us, and we'll do what we can to answer them as we're going through. Um, I know someone's going to be a total smart aleck out there and going to try and test me on things that I don't even know. Um, so go for it. I love it. Um, but don't be surprised if there are names of different um, art pieces here that I'm not even that familiar with yet, just because I haven't even written the labels for them yet. So, um, so yeah, it's an exploration. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about is the painting directly behind me. This is a work called Fawn. It was done in about 1973, and it's by a guy named Willem de Looper. Um, I'm going to sort of step out of the way so you can get a little bit better view of this enormous painting, but it's about 10 feet long. Um, Willem de Looper, if I remember correctly, he um, immigrated from Holland, from the Netherlands, um, ended up in New York at a very young age, and then DC. He was in Washington, DC. He um, started out. I think, you know, this, um, if, if, it, if I'm remembering this correctly, I think he started out as a security guard at the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C., but studied art, studied painting, and then through education and through experience, worked his way up to the Phillips Collection until he was a curator there. Um, he is considered what we call a second generation color school artist. So this is an artist that um, is part of the Washington color school. Um, the first group, uh, Gene Davis and his contemporaries, they were, um, they came into prominence in the mid 60s. Um, Willem de Looper was right on their heels. So he started coming up uh, in the late 60s, early 70s um, with his paintings. And the whole thing about the color school was um, number one, they're not objective. So you're not going to, you'll stand in front of this for 100 hours and you will not see a fawn or any other sort of recognizable object. What you will see is deliberately poured and placed pigments. This is acrylic paint. So um, acrylic paints, as opposed to oil paints or watercolors, first started coming onto the market in a big way in like, I think it was like 1964. And so they really made a huge impression on a lot of new and up and coming contemporary artists, or I should say, yeah, well, soon to be contemporary artists. And they were having a lot of fun with the physical properties of acrylic paints. Also, this is another example of um, chemical coloration. So these are synthetic colors, which means for our purposes, they're very bright. They're very festive. They are intense, really, really saturated colors. But acrylic paints, unlike most other, or unlike oil paints, can be diluted in water and it can be poured. And so what a lot of color school artists and other artists outside of the Washington Color School, like Fr Helen Frankenthaler in the 1950s, 1960s, but especially in the 60s, um, they were pouring acrylic paint, diluted acrylic paint across unprimed canvases and allowing the cloth, the materiality of that canvas to absorb the acrylic paint and to then turn around and layer up different washes, basically, of this coloration. So you'll see streaks, you'll see deliberate placement of um, acrylic, uh, like bits of acrylic paint that were placed directly on the canvas and then poured over so they create these kind of streaks. Um, you'll see uh, some dabbing, some brushwork, but really what you're looking at a lot of is poured paint. And again, this is all about this. I mean, this is very much what the color school was about. Um, was just this, this notion of saturation, this notion of color saturation. So this is a great entree piece to talk about what is contemporary art. Um, contemporary art is typically sort of talked about as kind of really any art that is 
created after about 1970. There are precursors to contemporary to a contemporary art movement. There are um, people that work in the styles and manners of a pre-contemporary idiom. <laughs> um, so from about 1860 up to about 1960s, 1970, this is what we call the modern period. And then art historians and collectors and artists then sort of defined that there was a shift around 1969, 1970, and we start to call this now contemporary art. Um, there are people working in modernist veins, even now, 50 years on, 50 years into contemporary art. And there were individuals before 1970 that were working in what we might sort of consider um, contemporary veins. But what is contemporary art? You know, there is no like solid, like single definition of what contemporary art is per se, except that it is artwork that sort of reflects what's happening today, reflects the sort of human condition, the human experience. Um, but it also is artwork that helps to reframe those quality or those, those, um, those issues that are specific to our contemporary culture. Um, so contemporary art, yes, it has new sort of um, topics, new kinds of uh, techniques and materials that it's working with. Um, but there are some areas that sort of talk about a complete departure from the past. I want you to think about 1969 and the uproar that was 1969. Think about moon landings. Um, which I think was probably 1968. But um, think about the moon landing. Think about the Equal Rights Amendment. Think about civil rights. Think about so many of the social upheavals that are happening at the very end of the 1960s. Think about the anti-war movement. Think about how quintessentially our society began to change during this time frame. And as a result, the art world started to expand to accommodate new media like video, installation, performance. It also started to accommodate a new range of artists, artists that would not have necessarily been able to come to um, the highest professional levels, even a few years beforehand. So you start to see the ascendancy of artists of color. You start to see the ascendancy of a lot of professional women in the art world. Um, and you start to see the, uh, you start to see openly gay and lesbian, transgender artists working after about 1970 people that are open and sort of you know, sort of open about who they are. You also are seeing new topics, new topics being sort of braced by a lot of individuals. Um, and it has, and a lot of those topics ha, are centered around sort of the social upheavals, the, the new ideas that are circulating within our society. Um, not necessarily for everyone, not necessarily uh, It wasn't as if sort of contemporary culture or these aspects of contemporary culture were just sort of uniformly accepted across the board. There were lots of, there have been lots of stumbling blocks, but there has been this sort of cultural progression happening within our society in these last 50 years. And a lot of it is sort of whispered about, or in some cases acted upon very specifically by the artwork of that time period. But that said, contemporary art is a huge mixed bag. There are a ton of different things. Those things that were permissible in the, the modern period still are within the contemporary period. You just have this layering on of new, new, new ideas. Um, so in a lot of ways, Willem de Looper is working in very much a modernist vein. He's working with non-objective paint. Jackson Pollock had already been doing this by the time that Willem de Looper comes on the scene with this painting. Jackson Pollock had already, um, his paintings had already been around for close to 30 years. Um, abstract expressionism had already been uh, very firmly set within our society. 
And other artists had been working with other forms of their abstraction for a lot longer than that. So this idea of abstraction wasn't necessarily something new. Playing with this idea of uh, materiality, playing with this almost sort of craft approach, I know that's sort of a weird thing to think about, but if you're thinking about treating the canvas as a textile and treating the paint as a dye, then you're looking at craft. So thinking about the materiality of these things and what it creates and the way that you're supposed to, um, the ways that you are allowed to sort of interact with these kinds of materials, um, this is this is a little bit more contemporary. This is a little bit more. This is something new. Um, so we're going to sort of pan back a little bit, and I'm going to show you something that I'm very excited about. Ta-da! <laughs> um, this is called Machine Three. This is a promised gift to the museum. Oh, I should point out, I want to point out, the Willem Deliver behind me was a gift of the estate of Philip M. Smith, came to the museum just a couple of years ago, and we are very grateful. Um, Machine Three is a promised gift. Um, so this is a work that um, is still owned by the collectors who, to, um, who actually collected this directly from the artist, Victor Spinsky, um, but the work has been promised to the museum. So it will eventually be um, accepted into our permanent collection. Uh, Victor Spinsky is a ceramic artist. He is an individual that was part of the 20th century resurgence of craft within America. Um, he was definitely not the first person to use um, ceramics as fine art. And, there, and he was in very good company. There were other artists that were working with um, craft materials like uh, wood and glass and um, different kinds of metals and, um, and of course ceramics to be able to create fine art. Um, but Victor Spinsky is um, somewhat unique in his work because he produced what we call trompe l'oeil uh, sculpture. So his sculptures are created from, this is earthenware, um, but his sculptures are created from various different ceramic bodies and they are created in such a way as to imitate, they, they uh, create an illusion of some other kind of object. This is a particularly early work of his. This was done, I think, in 1971. It's one of, I think, two machines known um, by the artist. And this was done early on in his sort of professional career. That career um, came to fruition in the fine arts department at the University of Delaware here in Newark, or excuse me, in the town of Newark, just north of us. And, um, and he was a faculty member there for, I want to say 40 years, probably longer than 40 years. The, um, he's probably best known for these um, really wonderful sort of ceramic sculptural objects, sometimes just tabletops that, um, size, sometimes considerably larger, but they are of unusual and sort of unexpected objects. Um, so like um, he would create out of ceramics a cup, a styrofoam cup that is pouring coffee all over a table. Um, he might use a Dixie cup. He might create um, a ceramic representation of a paint can and um, with uh, different ceramic brushes hanging out of it. Um, he was, of course, inspired by a lot of subjects in his own studio, um, but he was also sort of inspired by objects in people's homes. And so he would sort of recreate these everyday objects. Now, what we see here with machine, um, with machine three is, of course, much more fanciful. Somebody might even just describe this as kind of steampunk in a way. Um, this is predating steampunk, so this was, that was not necessarily in, inspiration, but he is definitely playing off this notion of large-scale machinery, large-scale valves, um, and um, he's having a great time with it. I'm especially interested in his glazing techniques Victor Spinsky was known for having developed, um, if I remember correctly, sort of being able to transfer photographic printed images onto ceramic bodies, um, which we may, I have to do more research on this. You might actually be able to see this a little bit um, in certain details of the sculpture. But um, even more interesting than, I, than that is the fact that uh, Victor Spinsky, all of those sort of 
the metallic sort of um, surfaces that you see reflecting and gleaming throughout the sculpture. This is what we call luster wear. This is a, a kind of um, metallic oxide that has been fired onto the surface of these ceramics um, in the kiln. And this was a process that was has been practiced for hundreds of years, but it was really, really popular in sort of the first half of the 1800s. So um, there's this, uh, he knows what he's doing. He's working with bodies really in just really, really elegant, fantastic ways. And he is able to, with the you um, between the forms, the sculpture, and then the glazing techniques that he's using, really, he's able to really capture this machine aesthetic. I'm debating about whether or not to make this a bigger platform underneath it because I'm sort of, I'm, it's, it's so tantalizing and yet kind of fragile um, that I'm afraid people are going to touch it. But um, I'm going to play with it first. So if you come starting on Friday to take a look at this, you'll be able to see it with two platforms. Eventually, it might have four. <laughs> and Ryan, we have a quick question. Yeah. Can you please repeat the name of this artist? Sorry, Victor Spinsky. And I want to say that you find his smaller scale sculptures come to um, uh, auction, local auctions, fairly fairly commonly. Um, he was pretty prolific. Um, he was associated with the clay. Um, uh, is it called the Clay Studio in Philadelphia? Sort of a nonprofit organization dedicated specifically to clay works. Um, and then, of course, he kept a studio at the university. So uh, he was he, he worked. He was um, there. Are, there are a number of his works around. So unless there's any other questions right away, I'm going to start uh, draw your attention to the work behind me. <laughs> um, if I am um, guilty of one thing, it's um, that I really love large works. And so I have pulled a lot of them out for this show. And I'm really, really pleased. We have a, so much room in our object storage right now. It's kind of. Um, well, it's it's refreshing, but at the same time, it's also sort of terrifying just how much square footage all, all these paintings take up. Um, this is uh, this is a form of what we call pop art. Um, this is a um, a painting by a guy named Joseph Kanapka, and uh, Joseph Kanapka was uh, based in uh, New or New Jersey, just outside of New York. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2013, but um, and. I have to admit, this is actually one of the first paintings I ever brought into the museum's collection. Um, it was a gift of the artist. And he um, approached us with, about the possibility of this gift um, because he had just come to visit the museum and thought that maybe we would like his work, which we did. We loved it a lot. So uh, this is called Hair, and it's from about 1973, if I remember correctly. Um, Probably the best known example of a pop artist, or one of the best known examples, is uh, Andy Warhol. Um, Roy Lichtenstein is another great example of a pop artist. And they were individuals that were working in the 1960s, um, largely in the 1960s. Uh, Joseph Kanaka would have been sort of considered sort of a second generation to them, sort of coming just at the tail end of the, like 1969 through the 1970s into 1980 with his work. The work is, um, again, acrylic on canvas, but we're not necessarily playing with sort of like the um, the uh, spreadable or horrible uh, characteristics of acrylic paint when it is diluted. This is all brushwork. This is painted. But interestingly, this is meant to look very photographic. More than likely, the artist worked from a photograph of this model. And even the edges of the composition have been sort of rounded, giving you the impression of uh, sort of um, <laughs> giving you the impression of a photograph, which is kind of interesting. Um, one of the things that's sort of interesting about the sort of contemporary um, period is that uh, subjects of artwork become, uh, there's a sort of new variety of subjects that are permissible. Um, and we saw this happen 
um, in the 1960s with folks like Andy Warhol, where he starts to use logos and different kinds of products. Think about like um, the Campbell soup can. Um, and those become the principal subjects of his artwork. Now, Joseph Kanapka, I'm actually gonna have you sort of pull back just a little bit. Joseph Kanapka does not necessarily feature um, the label per se as the central piece of his artwork. However, he uses shower to shower, there is a kind of shampoo product here. And you are obviously in sort of like, a, like in, in a bathroom setting or at a vanity, you're definitely witnessing sort of the sort of beauty grooming basically of this woman. Um, there is this sort of idealized feminine form. This was actually his wife. Um, she, is, uh, she was typically his model in a lot of his paintings. Um, but what's uh, interesting here is that you're, and what is sort of contemporary about this is that you are not necessarily seeing her sort of uh, in sort of an idealized moment of her life, but you're just sort of seeing this sort of intimate quiet moment um, and uh, sort of an unidealized representation of the figure, which is terrific. Um, also the wallpaper, if anything in this room is contemporary, it's this wallpaper. <laughs> When we finish with the detail, I'm gonna turn you around and we are gonna look at another, um, another sort of contemporary style that came out of the 1960s. How close? Um, this is a work called Chairs by a woman named Myrna Bloom, a Philadelphia painter. Well, actually, she was better remembered as a sculptor, and she would do these wonderful sort of uh, bronze, um, uh, bronze sculptures. I think they were largely in bronze, um, but with these beautiful sort of gold um, metallic pa patinas on the bronze of um, these sort of figures in motion. Um, oftentimes they had this kind of avian or bird-like quality, sort of like watching a bird take off, but being able to give form basically to the entire gesture of the bird taking off. It was really terrific stuff. But much earlier in her career, she was delving into what we call op art, as opposed to what we just looked at, which was pop art. Op art is optical art, art that is uh, meant to kind of mess with your eyes, but it's really talking about interesting sort of color arrangements and creating sort of the, idea, the illusion of different kinds of volume within the surfaces. Um, here we see a series of chairs. I was originally um, interested in this because of the chairs, um, because we had so many chairs in our own collection. I thought that this is sort of a fun transition, a fun bridge basically to contemporary art within the museum. Um, but you sort of see these representations of chairs in, and I hope these are coming out well on the screen because again, there is sort of a quality to this that sort of does kind of, I don't know, kind of twist your eye a little bit. You see that everything here is either in shades of magenta or shades of this kind of green teal color, but everything is the same value. So you're not seeing highlights, you're not seeing lowlights, but you're seeing everything at the same intensity, the same level of lightness, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, and so everything sort of divides into this, um, uh, binary repetition of patterns across the screen. And you are familiar, like you, the forms become familiar, to, they're, they're instantly familiar, but the more you look at it, the less familiar things become. Things start to run together. Um, you see sort of a repetition of different kinds of shapes, but, um, and ultimately there are aspects about the screen, or excuse me, about the painted surface that begin to move basically. Um, and um, in, in a way sort of affect your sight. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> now, um, Myrna Bloom did not invent op art. There were a number of artists that were sort of working in op art um, 
in the late 50s through the 60s. Um, and there are individuals that are playing with op art even today. It also was incorporated as a form of um, the, the design, the concept of sort of op art design was incorporated into a lot of um, graphic arts basically during that time period. So still um, has a, a great relevancy today. I'm really giving my um, my cameraman a workout today. So if you get a second, definitely give Kristen a shout out because she's, um, um, I'm actually not following the, the script that I said I was going to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the last two paintings that we looked at have a quality to them that is seems to be very heavily based upon photography. Sort of the observation of forms in photography and then reproduce basically within paintings. Um, this is, probably most true of this particular artist. And I'm sure that most of you have probably, or many of you that have tuned into some of other program have heard me talk about this particular artist in the past. This is Tom Wilson, um, who was a painter in Sussex County um, at the beaches. And um, he was based in Lewis, Delaware. Uh, Tom Wilson was a native of Delaware, uh, was raised in Georgetown and went to school in Rhode Island, um, I think for his last year of high school and then through college at the Rhode Island School of Design and RISD and um, moved to New York in around 1969 and um, focused very heavily on portraiture as well as in uh, kind of these kind of abstracted designs, these um, these heavily patterned kind of scrolling shapes and dots and um, ribbons throughout um, his uh, sort of medium-sized compositions. Very bright, very, very festive things. Um, and just a very, very elegant painter, a very precise painter all the time. Um, he got discovered in New York as a male model and spent time between New York and Paris for the next several years uh, working for Vogue and lots of other sort of like premier sort of magazines, fashion photographers, uh, runway, that kind of thing. Um, was not that crazy about modeling, but it was a means to an end because he was able to put together a little bit of money. At the end of the 70s, he finally left modeling entirely and he returned to Delaware for good. He had, of course, had family here, so he was back and forth all the time, but he came back for good and took over a family cottage in Lewis. Um, and that became basically the center of the sort of painting world. Um, Tom Wilson, had been represented over the years by a few sort of like local painting or lo local galleries. Um, I think he was also represented in Brooklyn, but he, or not Brooklyn, excuse me, in um, Baltimore. But uh, for the most part, he sold all of his works right out of a restaurant in Rehoboth. Um, coincidentally, the restaurant where he later met his husband. So. Um, he transitioned from these kind of abstracted designs, these precisely painted sort of abstractions into photorealism. He would take photographs of key spaces all over Sussex County, largely Sussex County, um, oftentimes sort of focusing on architectural details, architectural spaces, um, interesting buildings, um, townscapes, um, but then he would populate them with um, these kind of quiet, almost sort of floating figures within his, um, within these highly saturated, sun-filled sort of compositions, and um, and the precision of his brushstroke, that sort of that 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 photorealistic sort of edge that he gave to his work, um, that was something that had really sort of developed in 1968, 1969 um, in New York while he was there. So it seems pretty natural that he had sort of absorbed a certain quality of this and um, made it be, and it became sort of a central focus of works like what you see here um, that was done in around 1981, I think. 
um, but also some of the portraits that uh, the commissioned portraits that he did for uh, lots of uh, families in the Lewis Rehoboth area. Uh, coincidentally, we are getting ready to do a large scale retrospective of Tom Wilson's work, the first retrospective of this artist. Um, and we are planning to publish a catalog on his work. We've been able to find uh, close to 70 works by him. So um, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that'll happen in 2022. So pan around the space as we move into this next gallery and follow me. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to bring your attention. You have probably seen um, this painting before hanging in the museum. Um, this is this is a goodie. We love this one. This is a work by Lisa Bartolozzi. Um, she is a painter based in Newark, Delaware. Um, she is um, also an instructor. She doesn't have sort of a regular teaching gig, but she does teach at the university level. And she specializes in teaching about historic paint applications. Um, so this is a work by a living artist. Um, many of the works that we had just seen that we had come from, this really sort of represents that first generation of contemporary artists within America. And unfortunately, most of those individuals I believe that most of them have passed at this point. Um, but we have now sort of moved into this next room and it's featuring a lot of artists that are currently still alive. Um, we here at the Biggs Museum, we collect a lot of representational art forms, not exclusively as evidenced by the Willem de Looper. We do delve pretty heavily with an abstraction, but um, start, and this was a sort of, this was a preference that had been started by our founder, Soul C. Biggs, um, that, we, that he wanted to focus really heavily upon representational art form. And we've had a chance to really delve very deeply in our contemporary art collection on contemporary realism. We have also matched that with a growing collection of contemporary photography. And so this gallery, this sort of, um, not uh, this other gallery of contemporary art that we're sort of featuring within this video. There are a number of them up here though. Um, we are sort of focusing on this, uh, this duality between sort of contemporary realism and, um, and photography. And so realism is this sort of thread that, um, uh, sort of unbroken thread from the end of the 1700s forward that um, artists were, gravitating towards back and forth, back and forth. There's always this sort of wave motion, isn't there? Um, when we think about art history, but there are always been sort of artists that have been very focused on representing the real. And um, as opposed to idealizations or abstractions or um, simplifications of a subject. And um, Lisa Bartolozzi is one of those individuals that is definitely sort of drawn to the real with excruciating detail. Um, and like I said, she is, well known for her teaching abilities um, through demonstration in historic painting processes. So what you're looking at here is an enormous painting. It's almost six feet tall um, and it's called Scratching in the Earth. And it's part of a series of paintings that she called the Wisdom Series. Um, I believe that this painting was completed in 2013. Um, a lot of the work that she sells in galleries Oh, I'm sorry, the work was, uh, I was just corrected. It, the work was finished in 2007. Um, a lot of the work that she represents of her own work, not necessarily things that she's instructing on, but her own work are, uh, she's using sort of old master techniques of painting where um, slightly diluted oil paints are layered up onto a painted surface in this sort of painstaking 
process of semi-transparent layers, one on top of another, on top of another, almost sort of lacquering the surface of what is a wooden panel um, so that you come up with this kind of painted surface that is sort of luminous. It kind of traps light within, its, um, within these microscopically thin layers of oil paint. Um, and you're able to create with this technique sort of just an astonishing level of detail. Um, people walk past this and confuse it for a photograph all the time. And it's not necessarily that the artist is trying to be photographic. She is literally trying to be real. She wants you to delight in these details of, I'm just gonna throw my hand in here a little bit, the details of the wrinkles in the shoulders, the blemishes in the arm, the shape and sort of contours of the face, uh, the sort of the, the sort of elegant light sources that she um, that she casts upon these subjects. It's really just remarkable what she is able to accomplish with this work, and we are so delighted to be able to represent her here at the museum. How much time do we have? Fifteen. Um, I'm going to sort of round it out with another couple of works. These are works that have been done. With um, within the last couple of years, um, I'm going to start on one side and then I'm going to come crashing to the other side of the gallery. <laughs> so just follow me again. This is the work of a guy named Michael Robert. We did um, we featured an exhibition of Robert's work here at the museum a number of years ago. Um, well, actually, just a few years ago. It wasn't that long ago. And there's a little publication that's available within our bookstore about his work. Um, but this is the work that we were able to um, collect from. It was actually a gift of the artist um, from that exhibition. And it's fantastic. Um, Michael Robert is an absolute craftsman. He is by trade um, a trained blacksmith. And so his, uh, his craft production is represented in the kind of the sculptural textural surfaces that he creates with a lot of his frames. The frames are often sort of created specifically for the painted works, but his painting technique in watercolor and, uh, and, and eventually gouache, this is all watercolor, is just incredible. He is able to create details and textures in watercolor that I can only, I, I mean, they, they sort of make me gasp a little bit. Um, and everything, all of his work has this real sort of biographical, this autobiographical edge, even when he's depicting subjects like broken down cabins in his, um, in, near his home in Cecil County, Maryland. Um, hanging this work up today reminds me that I need to give him a call. <laughs> And when you're ready, I'm going to have you pan around the gallery and walk back in this direction. For a couple of very recent additions to the collection. Um, first, the piece that you see here in the bottom, this is a work by a guy named Carson Zollinger. He's a area photographer, a photographer in the Wilmington, Delaware area. Um, he has done um, figural studies, basically, uh, for over 40 years at this point. Um, I just saw this terrific picture of him in um, with this incredibly long beard. And he's all of like maybe 20 years old at the time. And he's carrying this photograph around with him. And he looks like, I don't know, some member of the, the Grateful Dead at the time when you could still see the Grateful Dead in concert. So um, that just gives you an idea of, sort of the breadth of his career. But he um, does these sort of figural studies. This one is a figure within water with um, the sort of floating sort of masses, um, but he really sort of tries to focus really heavily upon gesture and to, um, how do you say, to interpret his subconscious, his sort of dream states with the gestures of the models that he works with. 
Um, he is well known for interesting lighting techniques. He's really well known um, for these sort of underwater images. And I'm delighted to say that this is the first uh, fine art work that we've ever collected of his. Um, and um, you know, we're lucky to have it. Also a gift for the artist. And the last work I'm hoping, even though this isn't lit, I really wanted to focus on this a little bit. Um, this piece that is kind of cheekily hung at this terrific angle above our heads. This is by a guy named Jeffrey Todd Moore. He is a, if I remember correctly, he's a Baltimore area artist. And this is a work that had won a competition here at the museum. We have, um, we do jury competitions um, fairly regularly. I think we're gonna change the camera angle because we're not getting close enough on this, but give us one second. So Jeffrey Todd Moore's work, honestly, this looks better in life. Um, <laughs> um, but he is a realist painter, but he is, of course, sort of crossing over into this sort of surrealist sort of territory. And you start, you see these sort of clapping hands, these sort of assemblage of hands sort of protruding from the sort of face and head of the, the, um, of the subject here. And, um, I didn't get a chance to, um, to, to tell you, we had actually purchased this as a winning painting in a jury competition that we did here at the museum that focused on representations of the human body. I'm um, also um, pretty, crazy about the colors that are used within this particular image. And I promise it'll be better lit, but I did want to give you a little bit of a sneak peek. Um, and I did warn you that there was um, every chance, every possibility that um, you, were, um, you were going to see uh, crazy things within our war zone here at the museum. Notice that I'm not really showing you representations of the floor or boxes or painting cards or tables that are sort of strewn around the galleries. You're kind of getting a waste of, from the waist up kind of tour today. Um, so that's what I wanted to sort of share with you. Um, we have, so just to give you sort of like some bare numbers, um, between the two exhibitions on the first floor, as well as the top floor here, we are rehanging about 130 to 140 works. Um, so this is a massive reinstallation of an enormous portion of our collection. Some things will be very familiar to you, but there'll be a completely different context and new associations between works. So new, um, meaning we're creating new context about these works that will allow you to really sort of explore them in new and interesting storylines. And then of course, like I said, a lot of works that, barely, uh, that have not really been shared very extensively, not because we don't want to, but just because we don't have the gallery space. So we're pulling them out and we are bringing them to you. So um, with that, do I have any questions about what we've been taking a look at? Ryan, as you have been walking us through the gallery, you've talked a lot about the comparison between photo realism and realism and art. Um, you've shown us one photograph. Are there other photographs that will be on view during this exhibition? Yeah, we have probably close to a, I'd say somewhere in the neighborhood of about a dozen or so fine art photographs. We didn't focus very much of them on this tour specifically because they are behind glass and they photograph even more poorly than the um, than the last portrait that I showed, or the, excuse me, the last figure study that I showed you. So um, come and see these photographs because, um, well, photographs are light sensitive, so we're only really able to show them for uh, for limited periods of time in a year. You know, some pieces are only get to be shown shown for about twelve weeks out of the entire year. So, um, so this is your opportunity, and the majority of our fine art photography collection will be on view. Ryan, we have another question about the piece that we just saw. Um, why is it hung so high? 
we did a couple of interesting little pieces like that, like interesting sort of um, unexpected hangs within this gallery. So you'll have to come and see some of those things. Um, but sometimes um, you just want to create uh, something a little bit unexpected within the galleries and why not experiment with, the, with contemporary art. Um, when you are able to, I should say, historically speaking, for as long as I've been here, we have, I sort of made a decision a long time ago that we were gonna hang our paintings at a very approachable level. So the centers of our paintings or our two dimensional works are always hung at 55 inches. A lot of galleries do 60 or 62 inches, but we like to have them at a more accessible level down below. This gives us the sort of unique opportunity to sort of place things in sort of um, in, in different contexts sometimes to share artwork in different spaces um, within the wall or within a gallery space in sort of unexpected ways. And, um, and I think that um, based upon the subject and sort of like based upon the, um, the composition of those works, I think you're kind of like it. So try it out and see what you see. What, and you can come and please send me an email or send a note or tell any of our staff what you thought. And can you remind us when this exhibition will be fully hung and on view? Um, by hook or by crook this Friday. Although I still have a lot of work. <laughs> Signage is coming on Thursday. Labels should be done Thursday. So probably, I mean, I might still be hanging labels on Friday morning, but pretty much everything will be placed and open. You will be able to come and see it. And now you've talked about some surprises in your hanging here at in this exhibition. Are there any pieces that as you were trying to put them out, you found um, maybe dictated the rest of the gallery? Yes, yes, this happens all the time. Um, and I'm sort of used to it sometimes when, especially when you're doing a, um, uh, when you are doing a, uh, when you're working in galleries that have sort of a mix of both fine and decorative arts, you sort of have to work and to create sort of visual balances between those objects. Um, even here though, when you're dealing specifically with, um, with just the fine arts and, the, and, and largely with uh, paintings and um, other framed artworks, um, Yes, you sort of have to, you almost have to pick out the pieces that are going to dominate a gallery and then sort of create a space around it. So there really is, you have to, I went to some of the people that I was working with and asked like, which of the pieces that are here really draw your eye? So I can put those into sort of prime spaces within the gallery and then work off of them to reinforce those, um, those, uh, the tendencies of visitors to sort of gravitate towards one image over another. And it's not to say that one is more important than the other, it's just that I would try to reinforce expectation and, and, and then play with expectation sometimes to sort of create unexpected sort of spaces as well. I think that might be our last question. Um, we can stay on for another second or two, but um, otherwise I think I'm gonna go and I'll just see you in the galleries. Yeah, I think that we're good to go. Thanks everybody. I appreciate you um, uh, popping in with me tonight. And of course, if you have any questions, you're always able to email.